Welcome to all the audience out there to uh, panel three, the third session uh, on energy management, energy management systems, non-energy benefits, uh, and all what is um, um, connected to it. Uh, I'm happy to welcome you to this uh, afternoon session. Um, uh, we have very interesting presentations uh, ahead of us. Um, in the first session uh, on Monday, we had um, presenters from all over the world, from uh, USA, Australia, and, and Europe. Yesterday, we had a pure European um, uh, panel, and today as well, with an even stronger focus uh, on Northern Europe, because we have presenters from uh, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and whatever. Sweden again. <laughs> yeah. Um, today we have um, very interesting presentations ahead, uh, especially on um, energy efficiency in industry, on uh, decision-making processes uh, and on non-energy benefits uh, and uh, on measurement, the optimization of measurement points. We will start with Anders Svensson, uh, who's an um, energy and development engineer at, at Scania. We proceed with uh, Sophie Manon. I hope the name is uh, pronounced correctly, uh, who's a PhD student at the University of Technology in Gothenburg. Uh, the third presenter will be Markus Olsen, um, uh, from Norway, he's working at the Norwegian Institute of Wood Technology. And last but not least, we have Riccardo Bergamini, uh, a PhD student uh, from um, Denmark. So we start right away with uh, the first presentation. Anders Svensson is the first uh, presenter. The title of his presentation is Integrating Energy Efficiency in Investment Process. Experience from Scania CV Greenfield Foundry project. Anders is an energy and development manager at Scania for uh, about three to four uh, years uh, and working in the department for sustainable production. His uh, vision or mission uh, or motto, I, I'd say, is living the dream by improving methods and processes in the field of sustainable production. I'm really looking forward uh, to your presentation on this. Uh, yes, and hello everyone. As said before, I'm Anders Svensson and I'm located here in Södertälje in Sweden. And uh, Södertälje is also where we have uh, our headquarter at Scania. So um, I will tell you more about how Scania worked with integrating energy efficiency in our ordinary investment process. So we started like two years ago, we um, worked a lot with uh, uh, reducing energy waste in our existing machines. So we thought, how can we prevent that the same energy waste occur again when we invest in new machines? So that is the spin-off that started two years ago and the same time that we started with the new Foundry project. And I will, uh, you know, usually when I make this presentation, it takes about 90 minutes. So I will try to speed up and give you some, like the most value of spending time here. But briefly, we will go through the, the Foundry itself, the capacity and number of employees and so on. And also our original sustainability targets we had for the project and that's a little bit blurred now because I don't want to show it quite yet. Then I will go through the working process we developed so we can support energy efficiency through a whole investment project and I will finalize with some examples and experiences. So the new foundry, you know, we have a foundry right now at Scania, an old foundry, very old. So uh, the new foundry will have tripled capacity versus today, but the same amount of workers, which uh, tells us that we're doing an extreme jump in productivity, which is very good. 
and the new foundry is a greenfield foundry and that means that we are building it completely from the ground everything is new and we will cast new cylinder blocks and cylinder heads for our combustion engine and that volume will uh, cover the demand from uh, all the Europe demand of castings. So maybe you ask yourself, why build a founder right now at this moment? Yeah, maybe you saw the other day that we introduced our two first electrical versions of uh, trucks. But uh, yeah, we know that and we are aware of it and development is moving really fast. But the combustion engine running on biofuel has an important role in the shift to a more uh, sustainable transport system. And our hybrid solutions will also need an efficient powertrain from the combustion engine running on biofuels, of course. So we can see that we have a high demand of high quality castings during this and next decade. Yes, and the ambition. You know, the energy intensity in a foundry is very high and uh, uh, quite early we try to nail down sustainability targets for the whole foundry project. And it looks like this. The new foundry should be supplied with 100% renewable energy. We should have 100% heat recovery capacity compared to the heat demand. So the new foundry will be self-sufficient on heat down to minus eight degrees outside temperature. And once it gets warmer and warmer, we are starting to transit our heat to our surrounding buildings, both at the Scania site and the community. And we also aim for having 50% increased energy efficiency. And compared to our existing foundry. So we will have 50% increased energy efficiency per produced ton of castings. I will try to take charge again over the mouse, yes. And we will also have 0% CO2 emissions from our production. Is this really possible? That's what we asked ourselves in the beginning. And uh, we realized quite early that our existing methods and uh, working processes and competence does not support this ambition. So we started by get approval for management and also asked for resources. And here I also want to point out the thanks to the Swedish Energy Agency, which has a program to, you can apply for funding for this kind of project. So we got a kickstart using this fund so we, can, so we could create a good organization around these questions. And then we also needed to develop uh, aligned processes and tools and also update old tools, which has not been used so much recently. And most important of all, we need to increase our competence through the whole project team in the new foundry about energy efficiency. So we started quite early a train the trainer concept, which uh, has been very successful. So what about the working process then? Yeah, what you can see now is at this picture is Scania's standard for production equipment investments. And then we asked ourselves, what kind of content do we need in this process to support energy efficiency requirements? And that, what is really missing? So for starters, we set up, we need a decision-making process to follow the, what we call energy checklist, and also analyze how high is the contribution to our Scania overall sustainability targets. So this is the kickstart, the signal to start to integrate, to use energy efficiency checklist for the whole investment project. And during the next phase, which is the pre-study, that's where you do the on energy consequence analysis for different concepts. It could be like, what happens to the energy infrastructure around the building if we add six megawatt of heat recovery, or if we use gas or electric versions of machines, or what will happen if we, for example, uh, remove a complete process and so on and make life cycle cost comparisons to that one. 
And next phase, that's where we actually send out the requirement specification. Here you need the correct energy requirement for each machine and the correct appendices that the suppliers need to fill out to get the correct data back to us engineers so we can compare. And the next phase, that's where we get back quotation and then we evaluate the suppliers, we compare them all from an energy efficiency point of view and important to include the energy topic in the ordinary technical evaluation. In the next phase, we hand over to our purchasing organization and we support them with our calculations and so on if they see they have any value of it. And here is where we actually place the order of the machine. So the next phase, when we have chosen supplier, we monitor and follow up, identify the energy questions, and we also, very important now, prepare a plan to validate the energy requirements. And a validation is um, briefly, you have a target or a requirement and the validation process makes you, you do measurements to see if the, the requirement is fulfilled or not. Then we have something called delivery test. That is, uh, we, get, we need to approve the machine before it gets shipped to our site at Scania. There we have some measurement that needs to be done and fulfilled before they can uh, send it to Scania. And the last phase, that's our final chance at Scania to actually verify that we got the correct performance according to or with respect to what we actually order from the requirement specification. So before the process was not supporting energy requirements and after it is and for that we are very uh, that's a huge su success factor really and building a foundry is not quite easy it's, it co it consists of 36 bid packages one big package could be one machine or one sub process sub, sub process and so on so we needed to make some kind of prioritization and we found out quite early that 80% of the total energy consumption will be consumed by eight bid packages. So that's where we um, point the most attention to and resources to work and improve. And the 15% get some baseline energy package standard and 5% is still unidentified. And some examples from, I told you, we have a checklist that the project leader needs to uh, fulfill for every phase of the investment process. And he or she get followed up by a steering group. And this is an example of what should be done before moving from phase six to phase seven. So you need to show that you have integrated energy questions in the meeting agendas and you have followed up some requirements we have ordered and we have a plan for validating energy efficiency measures. And tools and methods we use in the process, benchmark and best practice, very important. We use life cycle cost comparisons, the validation process I told you about, about. I really want to highlight this one because that is the only thing that's actually showing uh, verifying that we got the same performance as we wanted from the, from the requirement specification. Energy metering, of course, and our strong train the trainer concept to increase the awareness among the whole project team. And since project start, we have 42,000 megawatt hours calculated savings and uh, 11,000 of these are verified. And uh, we have not too many machines installed yet, but the validation will be ongoing during this year and next year, and then it's the ramp up period. So it's a very interesting time now. We are in phase eight with all the machinery. And the 100% renewable energy supply that, that is guaranteed through an electricity contract with 100% of like guarantees of origin, orig, origin. So we got the water and solar power and wind power and so on. We also improved a cooling system that got caught in our working process. One supplier proposed a bad solution. We improved it and it got really exciting when we saw the results that our improved solution was so much cheaper in running cost. And at the same time, we 
improved, we need, don't needed an extra cooling machine to invest in. So we saved a lot of money there also. We also have some organizational influence. Other projects around Scania is interesting in energy efficiency in new buildings when we are building new processes. So we have been trying to increase our train the trainer um, concept to other projects and we educate engineers and actually suppliers are also calling us and ask how should we fulfill your requirements now since you made some like something new here. And that's very interesting. And finally, I want to end up with, uh, end up my speech with some success factors. Management approval, both from the top management and the project leaders is very crucial. We use standardized methods and requirements, hard work to develop, but very important. We merge process knowledge, process engineer and production technicians their knowledge is, is merged with energy efficiency knowledge. And I think that's in that interface, that is where the actual magic happens actually. And we did a prioritization of high potential bid packages, which gave us the opportunity to do a good resource allocation. So we cannot work with every single machine since the foundry is very complex and a lot of machines. And finally, we aligned the energy efficiency working process with our ordinary standardized investment process. So we didn't invent a whole new investment process. We merged new knowledge into an existing standardized process. A lot of processes here all the time. Process, process, process. Yeah. Yes. And uh, thanks for listening. I hope to be back in like one or two years and tell you more about the actual results later on. Thank you. Thank you, Anders, for this really great presentation. Uh, it sounds so easy uh, looking at, at the process description and uh, how you implemented uh, the energy efficiency criteria to a process. And this um, leads me to uh, a first question from my side, I have to admit. Um, what would you say um, was the biggest challenge in setting up this, um, this, this new or, or upgraded process? The, the most challenging part was to actually um, get the whole grip to not like just point out some type machines or some type uh, technology to get to understand where does the scoop end to allow me to uh, catch the whole investment process to find the actual le ambition level. Where should we stop? Because you can start even with the product development process to make the machine more energy efficient since we are manufacturing our product in a new way, but to actually see where does the scoop end. So that was in the beginning quite challenging to see where to define the scope. Okay, so it's very much about culture. That's great. Yeah, I think so. And then also I mentioned before that we got some funding from the Swedish energy agency. So we had two or three people that could work uh, from my uh, side uh, part-time with just focusing on this process and the technology and everything. And also learn about the actual foundry process is quite interesting. Okay. Yeah, meanwhile, we have uh, two questions, one from the audience and one from the, from the panel. Thomas Björkman um, asked, how did your suppliers react on the new type of demands or specifications? In the beginning, they didn't like react at all. Um, maybe I'm a little bit tough now to the suppliers, but the salesmen, saleswomen, they like point fulfill, fulfill, fulfilled, and then they don't understand what they really are fulfilling. At the since now, when we're doing the measurements, they are really surprised. Oh, did we accept this? So uh, they uh, once they realize that we are serious doing the validation process, they are much more interested in talking about how to go forward. They are not like 
uh, disrespectful. They are more like interested in, okay, what do we need to do now to fulfill your requirements? So it's a mix of interest and also some like frustration, but uh, overall they are interested in and like to work with this uh, kind of questions. Okay. Um, another probably connected, connected question from uh, Thomas Bjorkman. How do you manage to evaluate and improve your working processes during an ongoing investment project? Yeah, I think uh, I read the question like, okay, we, we have a timeline. We should buy 50 machines. So some of the machines must be first out, right? So that machines were the pilots. So we, uh, we, used them as pilots and developed methods and tools for them. And once they finish that phase of the investment, new machines comes to that phase. And then we use that experience to improve the process for the next one. So it's like, a, there is an instrument called something like, uh, it's a Swedish word, I don't know, but you have, a, you need to tr transfer knowledge backwards and follow the machine through the whole process. So we have some machines in the front are the leaders, the pilots, and then we use that knowledge to improve backwards to the new machines coming in the new foundry. Okay, great. Um, the question by Markus Olsen. Um, how is this investment process integrated with the daily work? Are the project leaders working in an in-house project management tool somehow? The picture you saw with the the quite ugly arrow, but it's working actually. That's our production investment process. And that process does every project leader needs to follow. And the tool we are, the project tool we have, once you go in a, in a certain phase, then you get reminded about what kind of energy efficiency questions do I need to handle during this phase? So you're, uh, as I told you before, we are integrating new or more knowledge in our existing project tool, so to say. Okay. Thank you, Anders. Very interesting insight in, into the procedures of Scania. And by the way, um, in the uh, chat, someone voted your background as the best background of the conference so far. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on to the um, next uh, part of our session. Sophie Manon um, is a PhD student at the Kalmas University of Technology in, in, um, in Gothenburg at the Division of Energy Technology. Uh, her research uh, has mainly been about operability and technical implementation issues related to heat integration measures in energy intensive industry. And energy intensive industry is also the topic of her presentation. Uh, it's about um, a Swedish oil refinery uh, and it's about quantifying non-energy benefits for energy intensive industry. I'm very interested in this topic, I have to admit. Thank you. <coughs> oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, exactly. I'm going to talk about non-energy benefits in energy intensive industry. And energy intensive industry has different challenges from, for example, uh, small and medium. Sophie, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I don't know if other, other people can hear you. Reinhard, do you have sound from Sophie at the moment? No, I can't hear her. Okay. Sophie, I'm sorry, I think your microphone has stopped. That's okay. Do you want to take a few moments to, to um, maybe we can, you could um, switch off your headset and, and restart it and perhaps we could, we could show Marcus's.
presentation because that's a video and hopefully we can get the sound through that. Is that okay? In the meantime, I take the opportunity to encourage uh, the audience also to ask questions in the Hoover app or you could also put them in, in the chat in the, in the Zoom app if you're using the web app. Um, as you, it's not the first day of the conference, uh, you should already um, be um, uh, familiar with, with the, the Hoover app. So um, yeah, looking forward to your interesting uh, questions and keep in mind, there are no stupid questions. Sorry, I don't see the presentation. Now we can hear you. Maybe yeah. okay. you use it without the headset. Yeah, sorry. That's okay. We'll, we'll restart your presentation from the beginning so you can have the whole... Sorry for the technical issues. That's okay. I think maybe giving you control of the screen may just knock your headset out. So, yeah. so I, we'll try without. Okay? Yeah, okay. I'll just share it now for you. Hold on. Okay, let's uh, start again and this time maybe you can hear me as well. Uh, as I said, um, energy intensive industry is quite different from, uh, they have quite different challenges uh, uh, from small and medium enterprises. And I'm gonna talk about the non-energy benefits uh, and use an example of a Swedish oil refinery. So, um, uh, as you all know, um, industry is a major part of the final energy use, not only in Sweden, as we see here, but in uh, all countries. And in Sweden, 32% uh, of the total fossil greenhouse gas emissions comes from the industry. And uh, from, from this 30%, you can see here that <coughs> Uh, there are a few large sites uh, that accounts for a very, very large part of the total fossil emissions. And uh, more than that, Sweden has a lot of uh, pulp and paper industry that also emits the same amount of uh, CO2 as these large, uh, large. So you can see the five largest sites here uh, comes for almost 50% of the fossil em emissions. And this is why it is important to look at these specific sites. Uh, and also it, uh, a lot of energy intensive industry uses a lot of heat. And heat uh, in these cases are a part of the process. So that complicates things a bit more because if you make uh, the process more energy efficient uh, and maybe more integrated, that could cause issues that would lead to um, in interruptions in the process, which would be very, very costly, and then it would not be worth saving energy. So it's important to take a lot of aspect into consideration when um, making this energy intensive industry more efficient. Uh, <laughs> and as I said, uh, a lot of heat is used, uh, but there's also a, lot, a large potential to save heat. And if you take into account economic factors, uh, there is still a large um, potential to save heat. Uh, but there are also uh, other factors that could affect this potential, uh, like operability and practical implementation issues, uh, but also non-energy benefits, which is what I'm going to focus on. Um, uh, so, the study I'm presenting here uh, aims to investigate non-energy benefits in energy intensive industry by quantifying selected non-energy benefits for two heat recovery measures at an oil refinery. And <coughs> uh, the two uh, chosen are increased plant output and, uh, and the monetary value of the emission reduction. Um, and they, these were selected since it could, it's quite hard to quantify non energy benefits, uh, but these were are amongst the more quantifiable <laughs> um, benefits. And uh, I should also say that 
these uh, measures uh, are a part of a previous interview study at this oil refinery where um, more measures were evaluated qualitatively with the engineers at the refinery uh, to look at operability issues and technical implementation issues. And although it, that study focused on uh, operability issues, non any benefits came out as a big factor in uh, a, lot of, uh, on a lot of the interviews for different measures, although that was not the purpose uh, from the beginning. So that's why we wanted to investigate that factor more and see how big the potential was uh, if non-energy benefits were included. Um, so this is a picture of the refining process and <laughs> I won't go into detail about this, but this is just to give you a picture of the complexity of the process. So uh, it, yeah, as I said, it's a lot of energy, a lot of emissions. Uh, it's more than uh, 11 million tons of crude oil coming in, into this refinery each year and almost 10 million tons of products and one and a half million tons of CO2 emissions. Uh, and as you see, all the process units are connected uh, in a complex way. And if you look at one of these process units, it consists of many different cold and hot streams that could potentially exchange heat. Uh, and uh, as you can understand, since every unit consists of <laughs> this amount of streams, uh, is yeah, well, uh, it's a it's a complicated um, yeah, com com complicated network of heats. Uh, so uh, the measure, I, I will talk about one of the measures that we quantified non energy benefits for, uh, and this is a, a, a process stream which goes into a reactor that is being heated by the hot effluent uh, uh, exiting the reactor and a process furnace. So um, what we thought about here was using excess heat from a different part of the process to increase the preheating and thereby reduce the burning of fossil fuels in the process furnace. Uh, this, however, uh, since there are a lot of spatial limitations in the refinery, this existing heat exchanger needs to be replaced uh, with, a, with a parallel compact heat exchanger instead um, to enable space for the new investment. But this heat exchanger it <coughs> is also a bottleneck in the process since there are a lot of fouling building up and they have to reduce the, uh, the uh, the feed going into the process a, a tiny bit, uh, some parts of the, the years, um, since, it's, uh, since it's not able to clean it. Uh, but a parallel uh, set of compact plate exchanger, heat exchangers would enable cleaning during operation and solve that issue, which would uh, enable <laughs> full capacity for a longer period of time. Uh, and um, there are several other non-energy benefits uh, mentioned dur during the interview study, uh, but I will focus on the increased production capacity and uh, reduced emissions. So here you can see the results from uh, the production increase, and I will explain this <laughs> table to you. Uh, well, I will say that the value of the increased production is an estimate based on average gross margins for many different refineries because uh, we don't, um, of course, they don't share that kind of information. Uh, but the, the purpose is not to get an exact number, but to get a picture of how large uh, share, um, uh, how, how big is the impact of the non-energy benefits, not the exact numbers. And, uh, uh, but it's, of course, based on the real process. Uh, and as you can see here, the, the first column here uh, is the energy efficiency measure without including uh, the increased production capacity. Uh, and the payback period, period here is short uh, anyway, uh, it's 2.7 years. Uh, you save a lot of uh, uh, LNG um, and uh, it don't, doesn't take a long time to uh, save the money for the investment. Um, 
but if you inc include the increased production capacity through the, the bottlenecking, uh, the payback period decreases even more to 0 0.6 years, <laughs> which is very, very low. Um, and the increased production capacity actually has a larger value than the energy savings itself. <laughs> um, so this, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, here you can see how the CO2 charges will uh, change uh, using energy market scenarios uh, for 2030. Uh, the new policy scenario is based on if uh, what's decided now is implemented uh, well, uh, policies now uh, and the sustainable policy scenario is based on the um, uh, United Nations policy goals. Um, and uh, this is to show that uh, the CO2 savings will play a bigger part if you look at a few years ahead, not only today, uh, because when we originally evaluated this, these uh, measures economically, it, 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 the CO2 part was not that big. But if we look only f five, 10 years ahead, we will see that for different scenarios, this will <coughs> um, be a bigger part of the techno-economic evaluation. So, uh, since uh, non-energy benefits uh, are, are, have a major effect on the techno-economic evaluation, uh, I think they should be considered earlier in the screening of energy efficiency measures uh, to enable to uh, implement more energy efficiency uh, measures. Uh, but of course, there are far more work needed. Uh, or, uh, you can not only quantify monetary value of the non energy benefits, but of course, you need to do it out of the technical difficulties and compare that to the non energy benefits. And <coughs> also look at more case studies, because this is just one case study. Uh, and also, it would be uh, interesting to illustrate how. Uh, technical difficulties and non-energy benefits can affect, could affect the ranking of energy efficiency measures and provide guidelines for companies how to implement this in their design strategy. Uh, so, uh, thank you for listening and um, there's more details about this in uh, the paper in the proceedings and you're also welcome to email me if you have any questions uh, later on. Thank you, thank, thank you, Sylvie, for, for this presentation. Very interesting. And uh, I immediately, immediately have a question on the mm -hmm. non-energy benefits, of course. Um, uh, the question is, okay, you calculated these non-energy benefits with an, with an estimate of uh, increased production volume. Um, did you discuss, the, the first part of the question is, did, this, did you discuss this calculation result uh, with decision makers? Uh, uh, and yes, uh, you can answer. Okay. Uh, well, uh, we discussed how much the uh, production uh, would increase if the bottom neck was removed uh, with the engineers. And also we discussed after the interview study, uh, which uh, energy efficiency measures had been, in, been implemented previously. And then they said that uh, they have had some energy efficiency measures that only included energy efficiency and those, even though the projects were quite far along, those were not the one being implemented at the end. But all the uh, measures that were implemented also had other benefits. But this is also because at the refinery, you shut down the process once every six years and then the competition between projects is very, very hard because there's a lot of maintenance that needs to be done. And then you can only add a few uh, new rebuilds uh, during this time because every week you shut down the refineries, very expensive. 
Okay, so it's a competition of uh, different projects uh, and uh, the decision-making committee uh, has to compare. So the, the question is, uh, how did the, the decision-making committee um, uh, react on the figures of the, of the non-energy benefits? Did they just accept uh, the, the, the figures? Um, we have discussed this uh, mainly with uh, process engineers uh, at the company, and but they agree with us that uh, non-energy benefits are important and uh, uh, they, um, uh, of course, they can't, can't give us exact numbers, but they uh, have read the work with the numbers and uh, uh, agree that they are reasonable. Okay. Good to hear. Uh, one question from uh, Ricardo. Um, do you expect that non-energy benefits would be relevant also in non-energy intensive industry? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. Uh, but you have to view it a bit differently. But there, there are a lot of studies on non-energy benefits in uh, small and medium enterprises, uh, which shows that it's very, uh, very important there as well. But uh, some of the, these benefits are hard to quantify. So I think uh, we need more studies where the benefits are actually quantified uh, mm. to, to get it on paper that how, how important they are. Your answer bears an uh, interesting questions, question in it. Is it always necessary to quantify the non-energy benefits or is it sometimes necessary just to uh, describe them as best as possible and if there's an impact on uh, strategic goals of a company uh, mm -hmm. it might be sufficient to give just a rough estimate as you have done it uh, mm -hmm. in, in your study. I think it depends on the benefit itself uh, because some of the some non only benefits are more soft and they uh, are important although they cannot be quantified in numbers uh, and I think there is enough to describe them, but I think it's um, it shows the importance of it more when you're able to quantify it. But I mean, production increase, it's it's something that's, I, I, I think that production increase, you have to put numbers on it. But if it's a better working environment and things like that, that could be an important benefit, although it's not quantified. That's true. And it reduces the risks of uh, failure in the production or downtime. Yeah, that's very important benefit. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. Very good contribution. Um, we move on to the next uh, presentation by Markus Olsen. Uh, he works with uh, the Norsk Treteknisk uh, Institute, Norwegian Institute of Wood Technology. Uh, and he works there as an energy management Analyst, I got this from LinkedIn, so we are stalking you, Marcus. I'm sorry. Um, and he, the title of his presentation uh, is "Energy Management in the Norwegian Sawmill Industry." I understand that Marcus Olsen has a recorded version of his presentation, so uh, I think this will start it right. Thank Welcome you. to this presentation. My name is Markus Olsson. I'm a researcher at Norwegian Institute of Wood Technology in Norway. And I will present my work on energy management in the Norwegian sawmill industry. This is a work I've been doing for the last eight years. I will start by introducing sawmills in Norway and there put them in a global perspective. Then we will see why they implemented energy management and how they did it. I will show you some results from these ENMSs and give you some success factors in these cases. An ENMS will be used throughout the whole presentation and it stands for energy management system. In a global perspective, uh, the production is dominated by China and USA, and then Russia, Canada, Germany, and Sweden. And we find Norway in 31st place. 
The production in Norway is 2.7 million cubic meters of sawn wood, and it's dominated by 18 sawmills. The sawmills in Norway are relatively small in a global perspective. The production in Norway is dominated by Moelven with 12 sawmills and representing 40% of the production volume. Bergenholm is another big group and then there are several smaller sawmills. The industry employs 3,600 people and the annual turnover is 1.1 billion euro. The energy mix in Norwegian sawmills mainly consists of biomass, electricity and diesel. Diesel is used for internal transport, forklifts and wheel loaders. And the biomass is produced from byproducts in the production. The electricity used in kiln drying, saw house and other processes and biomass heat produced in the boiler is mainly used for kiln drying and other um, heating of buildings. So why did the sawmills introduce energy management? Well, the reason was not energy costs. Uh, they are only 5% of the total cost in Norwegian sawmills because of low electricity prices biomass prices and diesel prices. Instead, the reason why they implemented energy management was a national support program and requirements from authorities. The national support program uh, made it possible for industry in Norway to apply for 100,000 euros to implement an energy management system. And the national requirements from authorities concerned the, the boiler and the emissions from the boiler in order to have a permit to run the boiler, they need an ENMS. So the reason was not that to save energy or save energy costs, it was because they had this support program and requirements from authorities. The benefits after implementing an energy management system were said to be reduced costs and reduced environmental footprint. And the reduced environmental footprint is important in the EPDs that are used. Uh, EPD stands for Environmental Product Declaration. And EPDs are used when you compare different products uh, in the building, when you want to choose wood or some other material. You can compare them in this environmental way. Uh, the energy management system also meant that energy jobs got a higher status. The top management was engaged in energy efficiency. More people were engaged in energy efficiency. There was a clear division of responsibilities within the company. The ENMS created a joint framework. So we had a structured work with energy efficiency. It increased the fellowship within the company and it increased process knowledge in general. It also meant that continual improvements were a natural part of the daily work. The ENMS concept that we have used in sawmills is called saw ENMS. And that was developed in a Euro European project called Ecoinflow in 2015. It puts the energy team in the center of the work. They are responsible for making investments to a certain degree and to lead the work with energy efficiency. They usually start with measuring the energy use in an energy review or mapping the energy use over the sawmill. And in general, these two steps to have an energy team that is working and engaged and to visualize the energy use is the two most important steps of this method. When you have these two, two parts in place, you can start by creating an energy efficiency culture. And you do that by have a transparent and shared action list or task list. Uh, you have routines for energy efficiency in the daily work. You set energy targets. You decide on an energy policy and then you communicate this internally. All of these steps are described in the SOE ENMS handbook that's available freely on the Equinflow website. 
So important introductory steps are appoint an energy team. This gives a framework for energy management and it elicits who is in charge. Start measuring the energy use and visualize it. Incorporate energy efficiency in the daily work. And here, uh, if, if you introduce energy management as a consultant, it's very important to divide responsibilities between you as a consultant and what you expect from the sawmill personnel and what they can expect from you. You should use shared task lists immediately. They should clearly divide who is responsible for this action, when should it be finished. You should also include energy performance in weekly meetings. And in this way, the top management shows that this is an important topic. By visualizing this energy use, uh, you can monitor the if you're fulfilling your targets. In this case, we have electricity use on the Y axis and the time on the X axis. This particular sawmill wanted to have the a weak number on the x-axis so they can follow the performance during a year. We set a target with a dashed line. If the week has a higher energy use than the target, the bar is red and the green bars shows when it's below the target. So you want as many green bars as possible. We also added a smoothed curve. Uh, so this is the running average from week one. The current year is in black and the last year is in gray. And this could also be made for the last 52 weeks so you can see the current state of the last year. But in this case, the sawmill wanted it from week one. Uh, there are also some figures here for energy use per cubic meter of product. So on the y-axis, we have the electricity use again. On the x-axis are the weak numbers. So to show you some more detail, I will zoom in. In the top we have 2015, then we have 2016, 17, 18 in blue, 19 in gray, and the black one here shows this year. From the start, this part of the sawmill had an energy use of 66.8 kilowatt hours per cubic meters. I was in 2015, so each data point here represents the sum of energy use for the last 52 weeks divided by the production during these 52 weeks. In 2019, in the spring, the sawmill set a record. They used 53.5 kilowatt hours per cubic meters, and that's a decrease of 20%, and that's worth 90,000 euros per year. After the, um, the printing of this paper, they set a new re record some two or three weeks ago that decreased the energy use by one more percent. Another way of showing the energy use is to compare it with the production. So in this case, it's uh, well, the economy of scale says that a higher production volume will decrease the energy use per product unit and that was really true also in the sawmill industry so here we have the energy use on the y-axis and the weekly production volume on the x-axis and you can clearly see that economy of scale is uh, <laughs> is working here as well increased production means reduced energy use per production unit Now I will talk about other energy efficiency measures and if, if you could, could call this a measure, but uh, increased awareness alone resulted in two to five percent savings in the first year. So just by visualizing how much energy do we use, where is it used uh, and uh, divide it in the departments, it created an energy efficiency culture with many small measures. So we couldn't see any large investments during this first year, but just by showing or visualizing the energy use, two to five percent was saved. 
If you have old pipings in the in the ground, you should re definitely replace them. Uh, in this case, the sawmill had t been talking about this for five to ten years, but it never happened. But when they had an ENMS, it really happened. And as a side story, um, the sawmill in this case, they didn't have to remove snow in the winter because the um, insulation was so bad in the old pipes. So after replacing the pipes, they had to remove snow. So that was a downside of this uh, uh, measure. Uh, so as I said before, many small measures have a payback period of below one year. For example, uh, there was this image here to the right shows a pipe with over 100 degrees Celsius. By bypassing this, um, uh, the plumber could uh, bypass it uh, in one to two hours work. They could save uh, uh, a lot of energy. So small um, easy measures is often often possible in many cases. Uh, the compressed air system is a um, problem of its own, usually. They have a lot of leakages. In this case, they had a zone division, but yet they could see in the graphs that it didn't work. So one of the valves didn't work. When it was closed, it was still open. Another sawmill had problems with the automatic on-off uh, during nights and evenings between production. Uh, it didn't work. You could see that in the graphs. And there's all, there are also some more technical measures like optimizing kiln drying programs. And then you have to know the process more. So the success factors uh, is in this case to create a motivated energy team. They should have the appropriate amount of resources. They should have the freedom to take action. We should avoid adding bureaucracy here. So the team should be um, working on their own, mostly. The top management should be inquiring. They should ask for results um, in a good way. Include energy management in weekly meetings, for example. In this way, you can have a discussion on what happens and uh, what the results are. You should learn from others. Don't be afraid of asking other sawmills what they have done. You should use strat strategic partners for some some parts of the work, like visualization could be best done with a consultant, maybe. Machine suppliers, they are happy to help. Uh, they want to, to sell uh, machines to you. And before they have done that, they can do a lot of work by implementing the, the best kind of machine, especially in this energy purpose. Uh, a machine, you should not only look at the investment, but the um, maintenance costs and the energy use is often much more important than the investment itself. And by doing all of these steps, you should create an energy efficiency culture. The energy efficiency work should be a part of the daily operations. It should not be an additional work uh, that you do on the side. It should be a natural part of your daily work. And you should um, aim for continuous improvements. It's not finished in the first year or the second year. It's an ongoing work that never stops. Final advice is to keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate or think too much before you start. As soon as you start measuring, you will learn something. And begin where the costs are the greatest. Thank you for letting me present my work on energy management in sawmills for the last eight years. And I'm available for to answer questions now. Thank you, Marcus, for your presentation. Very interesting, uh, especially when it comes to uh, energy management systems. I understand that uh, it's not a formalized certified energy management system like ISO 50001. And I uh, can understand that there are good reasons because you said you want that companies want to keep uh, bureaucratic work uh, as low as possible. Um, on the other side of the coin, um, it's always um, difficult with 
not certified energy management systems uh, to keep the sustainability because you could stop the program um, anytime. Could you elaborate on this um, conflict a little bit? Yes, I could. Uh, that's uh, true. If you have a certified system, you, you will have someone else coming, visiting you, and uh, they will follow up if you're doing your work. If you don't have, you have to do it yourself. In this case, I have been working on eight, uh, eight sawmills, and actually only four, five of them are still using the this uh, energy management system. The other ones, have, they don't have the internal resources to work with it so then it was up to me and they didn't want to pay me <laughs> to do that so then it just disappeared and they still have the structure and everything but they need some people working with it the five uh, sawmills that are um, using it and the successful they uh, have these persons that are engaged and it's a bigger um, sawmill group and as a bigger sawmill group, you can always uh, find people or you can have someone who works 20% uh, in this sawmill, 20% in this, so you can divide the costs. So it is a problem. I agree with you. And it's difficult to solve. So after all, it all comes back to uh, establishment of the correct culture, right? Yeah. Okay, we have uh, one question from the audience. It comes from uh, Kelly Smith and I pretty sure that it's um, uh, directed to you, uh, Marcus. Uh, the question is, did the companies already have the competency for this program? If not, how did uh, they cover the knowledge gap? No, uh, I understand the question. Uh, the companies do not have this uh, competence. So uh, I work at the research institute and we uh, help the sawmills in this uh, in many questions but especially in this energy management for me uh, so i try to teach and we try to include this work in the daily work and make some visualizations to make it easier for them because i know the purpose of the sawmill is to produce cubic meters of wood or products and that's uh, that will always be the case so you need some maybe external external person, at least in these small sawmills. They don't have any energy managers, for example. So you need an external person to, to help with it. That's the reality. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you, Markus. Uh, and by the way, um, you are in the competition for best background together with Anders. <laughs> <Great job laughs> Thank you. Um, we are coming to the last presentation of this uh, session. Uh, it's Riccardo Bergamini, a name that sounds very Italian, but I assume he's um, not because uh, uh, he works at, at, at Denmark. He's a PhD student at the mechanical department of the Technical University of Denmark. He's currently in his last year of the PhD and will hand in the thesis at the end of December. All the best for this, yeah. Um, in his presentation, he will talk about the identification of optimal measurement points for the energy monitoring of industrial processes. Um, and it says in the case of a milk power production, I think it's milk powder production, but all the power for your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, good afternoon to everybody. Actually, I'm, uh, I'm super Italian, but uh, yeah, I work at Technical University of Denmark. <laughs> uh, so this presentation is, um, uh, is going to be about a method to identify the uh, required measurement points for, that can be used also for designing energy monitoring systems. And it will be applied to milk powder production plants. Uh, for setting the, the picture, uh, in the field of energy efficiency in, industry, in the industry, there are uh, three um, major players with different goals and different perspectives, uh, which are lawmakers, academia, and the industry. So lawmakers uh, require industry to monitor energy consumption with the uh, long-term goal of investing in energy intensity reduction, and so looking at the 2050 uh, sustainability targets. 
Uh, on the other hand, academia develops uh, advanced uh, um, uh, tools for identifying opportunities for uh, in energy efficiency increase. For example, process integration techniques such as pinch analysis, um, which uh, prove to be quite powerful, but uh, are also time and resource intensive. And on the hand of industry, industry asks what makes sense to measure actually, and what to use this measurement for. Uh, and these three points of view often don't, uh, don't match that there is a missing link, um, which on the lawmaker side uh, risk to, to miss the 2050 targets. For academia risk that uh, there is low impact of the research done because the tools are not properly used or are not broadly used. And for industry, industry feels uh, often reluctant in, uh, in uh, taking action. So talking about the two objectives uh, of, the, of, of the lawmakers, uh, they ask industry to monitor energy consumption to finally invest in energy efficiency increase. And academia came uh, with the possibilities to, to link this truth, so to use the energy uh, monitoring for then identifying these investment uh, opportunities for energy efficiency increase. And these, among the tools, there are process integration tools such as pinch analysis, which proved uh, very powerful in identifying energy saving opportunities. And there are several case studies showing that between 10 to 50% uh, reduction in energy consumption could be achieved in the industry. But uh, it is also true that uh, and these tools are not broadly used in industries, especially in non-energy intensive industries, which have less drivers for investing in energy efficiency. And this is done uh, mainly because of the complexity of these tools, so there is a knowledge barrier, but also the time consumption, uh, especially for data acquisition. So with the um, goal of reducing the time consumption in data acquisition for these kind of studies, uh, we proposed uh, a method called required data reduction analysis, which aims at identifying the strictly required measurement points uh, that we need to, uh, to set up in order to retrieve data. Uh, and this uh, is based just on roughly acquired data. And this is done by um, basically recognizing the, the basic role of measurements, which is to provide knowledge. And that's why we measure things. And we can, can quantify this knowledge in terms of uncertainty. So the higher the uncertainty on a, on a measurement, the lower the knowledge we have and vice versa. So in this setup, the, the main tools that are used in this method are uncertainty and sensitivity analysis, uh, which uh, ju just to say it uh, quickly, if we have a system and, uh, and we have some inputs to the system with uncertainty, uncertainty analysis is used for quantifying the uncertainties in the outputs, while sensitivity analysis looks back and, and uh, traces which uh, parameters are the most influencing in determining these uncertainties. And by combining these two features, it is possible so to identify a limited number of parameters that are important to be measured. And despite the fact that uh, this method was firstly conceived just to reduce the time consumption in, uh, in applying process integration tools, it can also be used for designing a meaningful energy measurement system, which is why I'm talking here today. Uh, the method is uh, divided in four steps. So uh, first of all, uh, a rough data acquisition is uh, performed on the, on the process plant. Um, based on readily available data, such as uh, if there is already a measurement system in place, screenshots of, of this measurement system, uh, or uh, design uh, uh, specifications of the plant, or experience of the, of the plant operators and plant managers, for example. Something that can, be, uh, can require one to two days to, to retrieve. And uh, with this, a model is created. And uh, of course, the, the, the model uh, can be already used for uh, calculating energy saving opportunities. And, uh, but but uh, due to the fact that the, the data are rough, uh, also the roughly acquired, uh, it is expected that a large uncertainty um, appears on the results. So in step two, an uncertainty analysis is actually uh, 
performed um, in order to quantify how uh, uncertain we are on the results of this analysis. And based on this, we can also set a maximum threshold of the acceptable uh, uncertainty we can, uh, we can have on the results. Um, then step three, uh, perform sensitivity analysis in order to identify which are the important parameters that actually determine most of the uncertainty in the outputs, because these will be the parameters that we need to measure with more attention. And then finally, there is an optimization step uh, which is used uh, either for, uh, to minimize the number of parameters to measure with high precision and accuracy, or just define the required maximum accuracy we can, uh, and precision of the measurements we can accept on these measurements. Um, this method uh, was applied on four milk powder production facilities. Uh, I will talk more in detail about just one of these, which is called SP4. But um, we, we, I will also talk about uh, what the, the results we get by uh, comparing uh, uh, the four plants. The four plants are different in layout, but they perform the same process. So basically, uh, milk, uh, fresh milk enters in the plant uh, with 13% total solid content. It is preheated and pasteurized in the milk pasteurization section. And then it's sent to a, a multi-stage evaporation train where it is concentrated and most of the water is evaporated and it's concentrated to 50% total solid content. It is then uh, heated again and uh, sprayed in a spray dryer where it is atomized and uh, uh, finally dried to 97% total solid content by means of uh, uh, various flows of uh, hot air. And as I said before, these plants are, uh, differ in the number, for example, in the number of evaporation uh, uh, stages or the design of the spray dryer, but the basic uh, layout is the same. Um, so to show how the method was applied on uh, plant as before, first of all, uh, the first step of the method is to uh, roughly acquire data. So, um, we identified 45 parameters that were important in order to perform a pinch analysis in this case, because we wanted to do this kind of energy analytics. And for pinch analysis, what we need basically is uh, uh, data on temperatures and heat capacity rates, which are shown uh, in, in different state points, which are shown on this uh, plant flow sheet. And then we selected the uh, outputs we wanted out of our analysis which are the actual energy consumption for process heating, the minimum theoretical energy consumption for process heating, and finally the energy saving potential, which is the difference between the two. Um, then based on this, we acquired uh, in, a, in a quick way the, the data in a rough way. Um, but of course, uh, at this point, as I said before, the, the uncertainty expected in the results would be high. Um, and so we wanted to quantify it uh, by assigning a, a large uncertainty expected on this roughly acquired data and performing an uncertainty analysis. Uh, so for showing the, the impact of uncertainties in this kind of uh, analysis, um, we can see, for example, the ground composite curve of the plant, which is a, a graphical tool uh, often used in uh, pinch analysis which shows among other things, the minimum hot utility consumption, which is the distance, uh, which is the heat flow at, uh, at the end, the top end of the, of the curve. Normally this is uh, a single line as we see here, but when we consider uncertainty, this becomes a bundle of lines. And you can see here graphically that if we want to identify the minimum hot utility consumption, this becomes tricky because it can vary anywhere between 2,000 and 3,500 kilowatts, showing that the uncertainty of this kind of analysis at this stage is, uh, is too large. And especially when we want to estimate the energy saving potential, the standard deviation of this energy saving potential is 46% of the mean value, basically telling us that uh, the, the knowledge we have at this, time, this point is not enough and we need to uh, retrieve more accurate data. And so in this way, we quantify the need for measurement system that can also be reported to the management of the plant for proving the need of a measurement system. 
But then uh, after uh, identifying that uh, we need more specific data, uh, the question is, do we need to measure all the 45 parameters that we use in this analysis, or we can just measure with the tail less, uh, uh, no, less uh, parameters? So we apply a sensitivity analysis, which basically uh, assigns a sensitivity index uh, for all the parameters for the three outputs that we are looking for. And as you can see, uh, just few parameters have a significant sensitivity index index, while most of them as a negligible one. And this uh, basically tells us that uh, if the sensitivity index uh, is uh, negligible, even if we reduce the uncertainty in these parameters to zero, so uh, performing a very detailed measurement, uh, this wouldn't impact the uh, uncertainty in the output, which is what we look for. So basically performing a detailed measurement on these parameters uh, would just be a waste of time because we wouldn't improve our knowledge of the outputs that we are looking for. And only a few parameters are actually important considering this. Uh, if we compare the four different plans uh, at this stage, so the important parameters that have to be measured in the four different plans, uh, in this figure we see all the different parameters that they have, and in bars, uh, you can see the important ones identified with sensitivity analysis. And you can see two things here. First of all, just few of them in all, the, in all the plans are important. But then also you can see that most of them are shared between plans, meaning that uh, it is expected that uh, it is possible to generalize which parameters in this kind of processes should be uh, measured, uh, which would speed up, uh, of course, the, the design of uh, measurement systems. Finally, uh, the last stage is the optimization. So uh, we identified here the uh, limited number of parameters that we actually need to measure in order to reduce our uncertainty in the outputs and so improve our knowledge of the, of the system. Uh, but the question is, do we need, uh, which kind of sensor do we need to place? Uh, how, once, how precise and accurate should our measurement be? Should we just go and, uh, and place the best sensor we have available, or we can also settle for a, a cheaper probably and, uh, and less uh, refined sensor or measurement system? So this uh, uh, optimization stage has the objective of maximizing the allowed uncertainty of the parameters with the constraint that we, have, we want to have uh, the output standard deviation, so the output uncertainties, below a certain threshold. In this case, we set it to 10% of the mean, but it can be set, of course, to different values. And here in this graph, you can see uh, the standard deviation, so the uncertainty of the parameters. In gray, it is the beginning rough uncertainty. In black, you can see the uncertainty of the best uh, uh, achieved with the best uh, measurement uh, uh, system we can uh, we have available. While in color, you can see uh, the actually required uh, maximum allowed uncertainty. And uh, it can be seen that not all the parameters in, in, the, in the different plans should be uh, measured with the best techniques we have available, but we can settle also for some rougher uh, measurements. Uh, but it's also interesting to see that uh, a, all the heat capacity flow rates, which are these uh, C's down here, need to be measured with the maximum uh, uh, precision and accuracy, uh, which shows the importance of the, this parameter. While temperature uh, can be measured with uh, uh, rougher systems. So summarizing uh, the experience of, uh, on this uh, plant as before, we had available the flow sheet of the plant and uh, we identified first uh, in the beginning that 45, 45 parameters were needed uh, in order to perform a pinch analysis, so to, to do our energy analytics in this case. But uh, after performing uncertainty and sensitivity analysis, which we saw that just 18 over these 45 were actually needed in order to reduce the output uncertainty below uh, a threshold that uh, we set uh, as a sufficient one. And you can see them in these uh, bubbles. And comparing the different plants, we could also see that uh, most of these parameters were needed in all the four plants that we considered, which are these red bubbles, while the orange ones show the, the ones that are just needed in SP4. 
Um, and finally, we could also uh, define what's the required accuracy and precision of these uh, measurements if we want to reduce the uncertainty in the outputs below the, the threshold that we set. Um, so in conclusion, this data simplification method is based on uh, uh, the fact that measurements provide knowledge and that this knowledge can be quantified as uncertainty. And this allows to uh, answer to the question of what is needed to measure. And in this case, 18 parameters over 45 uh, were identified in SP4. And how precisely this and, uh, and accurate these measurements should be. Uh, so we, we identified the required accuracy and uh, the uncertainty was reduced to 10% uh, in, in terms of standard deviation. And these informations can then be used for designing measurement systems and then perform detailed energy analysis like uh, process integration uh, techniques or uh, other methods available uh, developed by academia. And this can be done quicker uh, once the, the, the data is available. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. And of course, I'm uh, available for questions. I went a little bit over time, I believe, but uh, hope it's fine. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, don't be sorry. I am sorry for um, not identifying you as a super Italian guy. Um, <laughs> I apologize. Yeah, 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 you saw you saw the name, so it's uh, it's fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so far, we don't have uh, any questions in the chat uh, to you, but I have one question. Um, so I understand that this uh, method is uh, in 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 a, in a um, let's call it a development uh, stage. So it's not uh, ready for the market yet. But um, I. I assume that there is some, some engineering effort for uh, applying this RDRA method. Uh, how much effort would you say uh, is necessary uh, for this method now? And uh, how much effort should be uh, necessary at the end of the development? Yeah, this is a, a very, very important question actually. So thank you for that. Uh, and you saw it right that this is just in the beginning, the first stage of the development, I would say, uh, because this is the conceptualization of the method. Um, and then we are discussing now actually with uh, uh, Gea, which is an engineering company, uh, how to uh, develop a tool that can be used quickly by the, in the market. And this requires uh, uh, some more development uh, in creating especially a software uh, for doing it, for, for um, applying it. So I would say that once the software is available, um, this is a, a fairly fast method to apply uh, because the uncertainty and sensitivity analysis tools uh, run automatically. So the, the user uh, re uh, inputs are not uh, um, that much, that many, and uh, and uh, the software can run in maximum one hour, can tell you uh, the results. Of course, uh, the most uh, difficult part of this is to create uh, the model of the plant, of the process, which anyways is necessary in any energy analytics. So uh, depending on the level of detail of the, the analysis you want to do, you define the model that suits it, suits it. So if it's just an energy audit, the model can be uh, more rough, but if uh, you want to, to do a pinch analysis, of course you need uh, a more detailed model and this will take time. Yeah, but uh, this is something that uh, would be required anyways if you want to do a, pro a pinch analysis. So uh, the, the additional time required for the, the method proposed here is, uh, negligible, I think, uh, compared to the, to the model, uh, to, to the build time of the model. Okay. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, yeah, uh, this um, sums up uh, a great uh, round of, of, of presentations. Um, we have some minutes left now uh, for uh, a general discussion. Uh, a message to the audience. There is still the opportunity to ask uh, questions uh, in the Hoover app. 
in the in the meantime, we can uh, take one question of the Hoover app uh, that is um, um, directed to to Sophie. Yeah? Um, the question would be: most of the uh, non-energy benefits uh, that you mentioned are linked to cost savings. Are there any uh, NEBs that are in other areas, e.g. better reliability uh, of appliances? Uh, yes, uh, of course, there are a lot of non-energy benefits. Um, <clears throat> and uh, better reliability would be one, actually, from uh, the proposal I showed you, uh, since there uh, it would be necessary to change the um, exchange configuration to a parallel uh, configuration that would um, uh, then you would also have a backup if uh, there were any issues with the heat exchanger and also there are other non energy benefits uh, which could have an economic value that are um, but that they are hard to estimate for example um, um, if um, uh, the air cooling air, air cooler uh, would have a decreased load, and that would actually help with a lot of issues during summertime when the uh, steam system is uh, could be overloaded, and that is a more complex connection and um, not much 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 harder to estimate. But you still know that it's uh, it, it's a um, uh, large benefits. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have, I think, four minutes left. Uh, I would have one topic that I would uh, like to hear your opinion about. You are all experts, uh, as I have seen from, from your presentations, uh, also on economic evaluations. Uh, at least you have to do. Uh, you have to perform them uh, at some point. And there's always the expert question, payback, return on investment or net present value. So we've seen, okay, engineers on energy efficiency mostly use the term payback. Uh, and that's mostly the language they understand and also suppliers understand it. But is this a language that also decision makers in companies uh, understand? Um, I would like to hear your opinion about that. Um, maybe we start with uh, Anders, as he is uh, inside a big company. Yes, and um, I'm actually dealing, have been dealing with a lot of these questions lately. So I can, my experience is if we are early in the, uh, I take the case study in Newfoundry project, if we are early in the concept study, what kind of technology choice we should use. Um, there is life cycle cost, the net present value more applicable, so to say. But if we are now in the late process, we want to make late changes, only pay off, only pay off. Okay, thank you. Um, who wants to go next? Um... I can speak for Norway, even though I'm Great. Swedish. <laughs> Well, my, my experience is the same as Anders. The payback period is what I've seen, but I know that internally in these big uh, sawmill groups, they use uh, net present value or other things as well. But um, maybe it's an engineering thing. I don't know. It's easier with payback period than you, <laughs> you know what you're sp speaking about, but uh, it depends on what you include in this analysis, of course. Yeah. Like non-energy non benefits or if it's only... Um, uh, yeah, production costs or, yeah, you know what I mean. So for us, it's PBP, payback period. Okay. And, and you think that it's uh, sufficient for the communication with uh, the financial people in companies? Yeah, that's my experience. But, but sawmills are small, so maybe that's a factor as well. Okay. Sophie, how's your opinion? Okay. Um, well, I choose a uh, payback period uh, since it's easy to, uh, I think it's easy to communicate and also in my case, the payback periods are very short. Uh, but I think that, uh, um, yeah, I think it depends on the purpose, why you want to present it and to who. Uh, so I agree with uh, Marcus and Anders. 
on that. Okay, and um, Ricardo? Uh, yeah, uh, my short experience is that uh, different companies have different uh, ways of, uh, of dealing with uh, investment decisions and they decide what, uh, what is required. So for example, working with these uh, milk powder production uh, plants, they, the, the company running them uh, wanted to talk about payback period. And so they had from the management a requirement, a certain requirement of uh, maximum payback period for uh, taking into consideration uh, investments in energy efficiency. While working with uh, a pulp and paper mill, they talked about internal rate of return. So that's the economic parameter they wanted to hear about. So we calculated that for them. Uh, so the, I feel like uh, the, it really depends on uh, how different companies evaluate investments. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I see this, this discussion would um, need a little bit more time to, to exchange all arguments, uh, pro and contra. Uh, but unfortunately, we are at the uh, end of uh, our uh, session. Um, I really like to thank you all for your effort uh, for the for the presentations. Uh, it was uh, it were great presentations with a lot of uh, insights and hands-on experience on energy efficiency and energy management. Um, uh, I like I'd like to thank also the the audience for um, um, uh, participating with with questions, and um, I've seen from the from the chat. Uh, that uh, obviously our panel is the most interesting in backgrounds. Uh, I'm pretty sure not my background is, is meant, uh, but um, uh, thanks to, to Markus and, and, and Anders, we will be recognized for, for your great backgrounds. Um, I wish you all a, great, a good day, a good conference, uh, and um, maybe you would like to join uh, the session at, at uh, the, the networking session at, at, at 1600 uh, in where there are no presentations, but you can uh, exchange opinions and experience from uh, today's sessions. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you.